An understanding of pathophysiology of obesity is essential to delineate the causes and formulate an appropriate management. So from a simplistic perspective, obesity can be considered as a disorder of energy balance, wherein the amount of energy which is taken in the form of dietary intake is not spent by the body in the form of resting and active energy expenditure. The major regulator of uh, these factors is the ventromedial hypothalamus which has a strong uh, interplay with different parts of hypothalamus to determine the amount of food taken as well as the amount of energy which is spent on a resting basis or the basal metabolic rate. The body gives a clear cut hunger signal which is mediated from the stomach via the vagus nerve when there is decreased distension of the stomach and it tells the ventromedial hypothalamus to start eating that we are hungry. Another hunger signal is ghrelin which is secreted by the stomach in response to hunger and this ghrelin also stimulates the ventromedial hypothalamus to cause increased dietary intake. Importantly it is this ghrelin which also stimulates growth hormone secretion and therefore in hunger state the growth hormone is secreted more but this growth hormone is not going to make the individual grow. It is actually there to ensure that there is more lipolysis so that there is a greater source of energy which is available. Following intake of nutrient, there is a direct effect of distension of abdomen which causes decreased vagus stimulation as well as decreased ghrelin stimulation which switches off the hunger. So hunger is a phenomena which is temporary and can very easily be fulfilled. Linked with hunger in the acute management of energy balance is actually the concept of satiety. Satiety is more important clinically in the causes of pathological obesity because hunger is a temporary phenomena while satiety has to be there for a long time. So lack of hunger or excessive hunger can happen in certain situations but major problems that we see in terms of monogenic obesity are problems of satiety when the body doesn't really know that it has got enough to eat and we should stop. The two major signals which come in this regard are the GLP-1 which is glucagon like peptide 1 which is released by the duodenal cells in response to the intake of carbohydrate and it has multitude of actions one of the major action is to actually delay gastric emptying so if the gastric emptying is delayed the stomach will be full and body will feel that it is actually satiated it also has a direct effect on the ventromedial hypothalamus to cause decrease appetite and induce satiety the other agent which basically is produced by the gut is pyy which acts on the orixogenic pathway, the pathway which actually tells body to eat and predominantly on the neuropeptide Y to inhibit it and therefore reduce the orixogenic signal. So we have talked about the acute control of energy metabolism by inducing hunger mediated predominantly by vagus and ghrelin and the message to the ventromedial hypothalamus regarding satiety mediated by PYY and GLP-1. But these are just the acute control. The chronic control of energy metabolism is largely done at the level of adipocyte because adipocytes are the stores in the body and they give body the idea as to how much energy is actually stored there. And based upon that, the body can then decide whether it needs to take more food or whether this amount of energy can be utilized to increase resting energy expenditure or to start energy intense processes like growth, puberty and reproduction. And the link between nutrition and essentially all the three, the important parameters that we pediatric endocrinologists look at, the growth, puberty and reproduction is essentially the adipocytokine leptin, which is acting on the leptin receptor to act on the anorexic pathway. So, Hypothalamus has an orexogenic pathway working via neuropeptide Y which increases appetite. It also has an anorexic pathway which says okay enough is enough we don't need to eat more acting through the pro-opiomelnocotin which is converted by the pro-convertase into three parts which is opio which is endorphin, meleno which is MSH or melanocyte stimulating hormone and the ACTH. 
the MSH acts on the MC4 receptor to induce the anorexic signal. So in energy replete state, the body produces more leptin which then acts on the ventromedial hypothalamus at the leptin receptor to cause an increased uh, production of POMC which is then converted into the MSH which causes anorexia through the MC4 receptor. Any abnormality in this anorexic pathway is expectedly associated with hyperphagia which is uncontrollable urge to eat along with pathological obesity which presents at a early age and at a young age. Once the body senses that there is enough adipocyte, that there is enough leptin being produced, it will then also start to act in other forms. And the major perk then would be to spend more energy by using the sympathetic pathway to increase resting energy expenditure. And resting energy expenditure plays an important role in the overall metabolism of an individual. And once the energy levels are even more, there is more storage, there is more leptin, then there is a permissive role to grow, to have bone development, to develop puberty, to think of pregnancy. So clearly there is an important permissive role of leptin in all these regulatory pathways. And therefore in situations like anorexia nervosa, malnutrition, systemic illnesses like celiac disease when the body fat percentage is very less, leptin levels will be very less and therefore activities like growth, bone formation, puberty and pregnancy are deferred. Linked to the pathophysiology of obesity are the complications which happen with obesity and these complications are largely due to insulin resistance and this insulin resistance is induced by the fatty acids which is taken in the body, is absorbed by the gut and then it has the option to go into the cutaneous pool where one can store this or go into the visceral pool predominantly in the liver and pancreas where this adiposity is distributed. So therefore the amount of fat taken and the capacity of an individual to store the subcutaneous fat will decide about the subsequent outcome in terms of complications. Metabolic complications are directly linked to the amount of fat which is deposited in the liver and other visceral area, the more the visceral adiposity, more there would be metabolic complications. So individuals who are born large at birth will have a larger adipocyte pool and therefore they would be able to store more fat than those who are born small for gestational age with smaller adipocyte pool. Therefore, Large for gestational age babies do not develop metabolic complications even at a higher body mass index as compared to those who were born small for gestational age and have a very rapid catch up. So the key concept, the key mantra in adiposity complications is to track and keep tracking one's BMI percentile and not aim for significant changes in terms of BMI to avoid visceral adiposity. Once visceral adiposity had set in, this of course will result in the development of uh, fatty liver, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and gallstones, but also result in decreased action of insulin, causing insulin resistance, hyperinsulinism, the condition which is associated with subsequent development of impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypertension, dyslipidemia, so a number of conditions are related to insulin resistance. It's important to emphasize that while hyperinsulinemia is central to the effects of obesity, the peripheral blood insulin levels is a very poor surrogate marker of portal insulin which is relevant in terms of insulin resistance. So what we want to look at is actually the level of insulin around the portal system but what we are looking at is just in the blood. Moreover, the insulin has a, small, uh, has a short half-life, has a significant fluctuation. So therefore, insulin is not a good marker of insulin resistance and routine measurement of fasting insulin in obesity is clearly of little help and strongly discouraged. There can also be certain direct metabolic effects of obesity as well as mechanical effects. So deposition of fat in the erogenous tract 
will result in sleep apnea. This condition presents in children more with poor worsening of school performances, headache, early morning drowsiness and sleepiness. There could be slipped capital femoral epiphysis and osteoarthritis because of uh, orthopedic problem. Benign intracranial hypertension is common because of increased intracranial pressure. And long-standing obesity has also been associated with glomerulosclerosis. So the key to really decrease the amount of complications of obesity is to work on to decrease the weight to achieve good outcome in this situation. Obesity, as discussed earlier, has a very vital link with thyroid hormone. So this could be considered as a preventive mechanism in that as obesity increases and leptin level increases, it then activates the TRH, the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which increases the TSH, probably with the aim to increase the resting energy expenditure and therefore reduce adiposity. But this mechanism does not proceed any further and there is no increase in thyroxine. So obesity is associated with mildly elevated TSH levels up to 6 to 7 and 8 with normal T4, normal T3. This is a compensatory response. It is the effect of obesity and not the cause of obesity. It is reversible and no treatment is required if there is marginal dysfunction or thyroid function in obesity. As discussed, obesity has a significant impact on growth and body needs a particular amount of leptin and adipocyte to start growing. Moreover, obesity is also associated with insulin resistance, therefore causing a decrease in the insulin-like growth factor binding protein, which results in increased free IGF-1 causing increased growth. Insulin can also act on the IGF-1 receptor and there can also be effects as far as the aromatase process because there is more aromatase in the adipocyte and estrogen can stimulate further growth hormone secretion. So in general, overnutrition results in a state of growth hormone sensitivity and rapid growth. However, the direct effect of obesity on growth hormone is to reduce the levels of growth hormone. So body becomes more sensitive and therefore individuals with obesity may have a falsely positive growth hormone stimulation test. This has prompted to the use of separate cutoffs for growth hormone in obese adults. Similar data is lacking in children and therefore is not routinely recommended. Obesity also influences the timing of puberty in girls. So if there is obesity, the leptin levels will really stimulate and there could be an early puberty. But Severe obesity actually disrupts the gonadotropin pathway and results in a stalled puberty. So obese girls tend to have an early thylarchy, but the menarche can actually be delayed. In boys, the effect is largely through the increased aromatization and production of estrogen, which inhibits the LH secretion and therefore obesity is associated with delayed puberty. And one important correlation of obesity and delayed puberty is that because adrenarche is actually enhanced, these individuals will have a normal pubarche. So delayed puberty with normal pubarche is hallmark of obesity.